Katya Weinert. Hi everyone, welcome. Today I'm doing a non-spoiler review of The Girls I've Been by Tess Sharp. I received an advanced reader copy from NetGalley in exchange for an honest review. This is a young adult, new adult mystery thriller and one which I as an adult actually very much enjoyed. Reasons being, we start off with what seems a very familiar situation for a young adult novel of having three teens, well this isn't typical, walk into a bank, um, but you've got three teens walking into a bank. The main character is Nora and she goes in with her best friend Wes, who is also her ex-boyfriend, and her other friend or their mutual friend Iris who is Nora's secret lover and you think ah okay there's going to be some drama between these three characters because of the relationships and it was refreshing to find that that was not the case because they go into the bank to deposit some money and are held at gunpoint and yes there are frictions between the three of them but it is all in the unfolding of the mysteries around Nora and her background um, that we realize the whole situation between the three of them and the secrets are nothing to do with any petty jealousies. It is far, far more complex. The plot and the pacing follow a really thrilling back and forth into the present where they're now suddenly in the bank held at gunpoint and there's hostages and life and death situation and then you've got these flashbacks going back to Nora's past and all the girls she's been and how is this going to help her make sure that everyone gets out safe because that's her main objective and I mean she's a 17 year old girl how does she think that she could be so pivotal to all of the events that are unfolding in that bank at that moment? Now, like the book, let me take you back to the main premise. So going back in time, Nora, when she was 12 years old, something happens that's a catalyst that makes her say, right, I need a new life. I need a break from all of this because we find that she has been leading a life of crime. She was born into a life of crime thanks to her mother making sure that Nora is always her accomplice in trying to uh, fulfill her goal of having the perfect con. And each time Nora's mother chooses someone who is really questionable, someone who has things to hide and wouldn't be able to easily explain that she has stolen money that they probably shouldn't have in the first place. So she targets men who have um, gotten their, their money through ill gains. And in doing so, she actually puts Nora at great risk. And we find Nora at 12, something happens and she decides to start a life anew and to become Nora, which is who we get in the bank at that point. And the person who helps her lead this new normal life is her older sister, who is her half sister, and who has experienced the very same things that Nora went through. What we get in the story of the flashbacks is Nora desperately wanting a relationship with her mother. And what we get is an understanding of the complexity of their relationship, which I won't go into because that might be a spoiler. However, it gives us an understanding by going back in time as to why she feels she's able to, more than a lot of other people in that bank, face two gunmen who are unstable, unpredictable, and extremely stressed because something's gone on that is sort of messing with their plans. I thought, aside from the plot and pacing, which is brilliant, that the character development is top notch. You have got really complex characters in Nora and her sister, but also the character development leads on or bleeds into um, Wes and Iris as well. You've got, you know, the other side characters as well being very interesting, but those four characters I would say are extremely interesting. And I liked the fact that this is the first book that I've read where a character is struggling with an endometriosis flare up while the story is unfolding. And the reason being that this is actually Endometriosis Awareness Month. So I thought it was timely to actually review it at the same time and say that I thought Tess Sharp did a brilliant job of having a 
a character who is struggling physically with endometriosis, but who is not this weakest link in the story. I love the fact that despite suffering, being in pain, the character remained really pivotal and strong in, in the face of everything that was happening. So I'm a huge fan of that. <laughs> I will say there are a lot of trigger warnings, <laughs> a lot of trigger warnings for this book. And I suppose that's normal for mysteries and thrillers. Um, I think it's too extensive for me to actually list out for you right now because that would give a lot of the plot away. A lot of the triggers are actually linked to um, the girls that Nora has been and the whole point of the story is having that unfold very slowly. So I think I'll just say that there are trigger warnings, you know, you can pretty much hit most of them. Um, not all of them, but most. And the violence depicted, I would say, is kept to a minimum. Um, but there's certainly, you know, other violent acts alluded to. So I'd say, yep, lots of violence. Most of it is handled in a very sort of like flashback. This is the aftermath, um, not the actual act of the violence. Whereas there are a couple of scenes of the actual act of violence. I thought that this book was extremely enjoyable to read, very engaging and I would happily read something else from Tess Sharp. If you've stayed with me this far, thanks so much. And let me know, are you intending reading the book? Um, have you already read it? What did you think? And if you are willing to, or you're interested in, then I'm next going to go on to some information about endometriosis for Endometriosis Awareness Month. So what is endometriosis? It is a condition where the lining of the womb spills out and adheres to other areas such as the fallopian tubes or your ovaries and various other organs. When it grows normally in your uterus, the um, lining sheds each month, creating a monthly cycle. But endometriosis means that endometrial tissue can also shed and be implanted or attached to organs outside of the uterus. And that causes inflammation and cysts and scar tissue throughout the pelvic region. Common symptoms, but not limited to, these are just the common ones, pelvic pain, chronic pelvic pain, um, problems with um, IBS or bowel movements, constipation, diarrhea, um, painful sex, painful urination, gastrointestinal issues, abnormal or heavy periods, and infertility. In my case, I have chronic pelvic pain, occasional bowel problems, and uh, heavy periods known as menorrhagia. And also I'm prone to having migraines, which is perhaps a lesser symptom that I've read about more recently and I'll talk about later. Um, I also have suspected infertility. It's not a, a case of if you have endometriosis, you're not going to be able to have kids. So I'll stress that but it is um, a symptom that uh, people can have. Um, in terms of pain, it's um, estimated that about 25% of women can have endometriosis, can have all of these um, growths and adhesions, but might not actually have the symptoms. So it's interesting that there are four levels of uh, endometriosis, but those are actually levels that are um, not based on your symptom, but are based on how widely the adhesions and um, the growths are spread throughout the pelvic area. So it, it's nothing to do with how painful you actually find the endometriosis, but very often it could be. I mean, the more adhesions you have to different organs, then um, you know the inflammation could be more widespread as well. In my case, I have a stage four endometriosis, which means that um, the scar tissue is in a lot of my organs, uh, including my bowel and my bladder. The cause of endometriosis isn't known yet. On the National Health Service website uh, in the UK, they talk about suspected um, reasons for endometriosis. These can include genetics. So um, it's found that a lot of women who have got endometriosis and even fibroids tend to be from specific ethnic groups more so than other ethnic groups. So if you fall into um, 
say Afro-Caribbean, you are more likely uh, to develop endometriosis than someone who is Caucasian. Um, but that is not a hard and fast rule. You can be Caucasian and have fibroids and endometriosis. You can have really severe cases of those. Another theory is that there is retrograde menstruation that occurs. So rather than when you have your period, you actually having the blood just flow out as it's meant to, um, that it sort of like goes backwards and those cells then don't leave your body and they cause the adhesions and the inflammation by embedding themselves into the organs and the pelvis. It's also thought that endometriosis can be caused by a problem with the immune system. And another idea is that some endometrium cells can travel through your body, through your bloodstream and lymphatic system. So I'll very briefly go back to um, the link with migraines and endometriosis. Like I say, it's not one of the main things that's listed as a symptom and everyone has um, varying degrees of uh, a symptom, for example. Some might not have a particular one. So nausea and vomiting is listed as something that a lot of women uh, might have when they have a flare-up. Um, but that's something that I've had very rarely. Um, I've, I, I can only count once that I've actually had to throw up. There have been more occasions of me feeling sickly, um, but that doesn't tend to be uh, the symptom that I, I experience. I tend to experience a lot of um, pelvic pain and um, back pain, lower back pain. Uh, that's quite excruciating at times. Um, but more recently, uh, and when I say recently, it's like in the last five, six years, so not that recent. But in the last five, six years, I have had an increase in the number of migraines I have because I didn't have them in my teens and 20s. I'll show you a couple of pictures. And in these pictures, you'll see that my migraine actually exhibits as, you know, facial edema. So when I have a severe migraine, other people actually know. And I feel very sympathetic towards people who have migraine and it doesn't show because I think we as, you know, just generally as people, we tend to have more sympathy for someone else when we can see the evidence of what's going on. So um, I know that when I had started getting migraines, I used to get silent migraines and it was an extremely disconcerting sort of migraine uh, to, because I didn't actually have any pain, which I'm really grateful for. But what I did have was visual distortion. So I would have the periphery of my vision sort of like um, deconstructing and reconstructing. And I, I didn't know what was going on. I had my eyes checked and everything. And the conclusion was that I was having silent migraines. So if you've ever had that, you know, potentially you could have had a silent migraine when your vision distorts and reappears. Um, but <laughs> more recently I've been having the sort of migraine that makes my head feel like it's splitting open. So it's really, really severe. Um, and it also causes my entire face to swell up, especially my eyes and uh, one eyelid more so than the other, but both eyelids almost shut. My medication thankfully helps. But what is interesting to note is that even when the facial swelling goes and my head doesn't feel like it's splitting anymore, I do then suffer for quite a while with brain fog. And I can sometimes still be, um, for example, like slurring my words. So I might look okay, um, usually around three hours after the medication, I look fine, but I am not quite there yet. <laughs> so it, it, it takes a while. And that is pretty much my conclusion on my personal experience of endometriosis. What I'm going to do is leave some links in the description of this video in case you'd like to learn a little bit more yourself and also listen to some video clips of other women describing what they go through. Thanks so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy my channel. Take care. Thanks.